Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to another exciting afternoon of Organic Chemistry with your host, me, Dr. White. Now, as I sent out, I think it was either Friday or Saturday, I forgot which, we're having test number two this Wednesday and part of Thursday, because I'll do what I did before. Let me get something open. Everybody see test number two information on your screen? Thank you. All right. I sent this out when on the 17th, whatever day that was. But anyways, on Wednesday, I'll be giving test number two online. You'll download it just like you did before for test one. You'll have until Thursday, 10 a.m. to finish it and upload it. Uh, it has nine pages, 10 problems. Some of the problems are multiple part in this school, in this class. I've never given a multiple choice test. Even general chemistry, I only put max six multiple choice, eight, 10 points on a 100 point test. Dr. White doesn't like multiple choice personally or to for my students. Now, it will cover alcohols, thiols, ethers, ethylene oxide reactions, not nomenclature, aldehydes and ketones. Here's the point breakdown, general knowledge, 11 points, nomenclature, 34, reactions, 60. You add it all up, oh, 105. So there's five, yes, five bonus points. And this test, as with all my tests in the final two, will not be open note test. I put some things in there to tell me if you are opening your notes. Please don't, that's cheating. I'll do a review today right after I'm done with this. We'll have our regular Zoom meeting on Wednesday. We'll have a lab we'll do, and that's that. Uh, a couple things real quick. Uh, for nomenclature, remember there's two type of nomenclature questions. One is, here's the structure, give the IUPAC name. The other is, here's the name, and that includes both common and IUPAC draw the structure, and reactions, the bulk of these, except for three problems or four, I can't remember exactly, are give the organic product or products, those three or four give the starting materials, the reactants for the following re reaction. And that's test number two material. Any questions on that? Everybody out in the peanut gallery, oh, I just did a generation gap on you. If you wonder what peanut gallery is, go to Google and look it up. It's from the Howdy Doody show. But anyways, and no, I'm not Buffalo Bob. Any questions? Well, I do. I got to ask. Did anybody happen to drive by a gas station and think about that the gasoline contains ethanol and that's an alcohol? Did anybody happen to be in a supermarket or a liquor store? and see some vodka, you know, the good stuff, Grey Goose or Absolute. But then again, the Costco French vodka is really good too and inexpensive. And think about that has ethanol in it too and alcohol. Did anybody happen to pick up a bottle of rubbing alcohol? And think about it's, oh, I think I got one taker. And it's got isopropyl alcohol, nobody calls it by the IUPAC name, 2-propanol. And that's an alcohol and rubbing alcohol. I'll do one more. If you notice, I didn't nail, put my nail polish on, like never. But can anybody look at a bottle of nail polish remover and see that it's acetone and that's the ketone? Remember, organic chemistry outside of my lectures is all around you. And it won't hurt to think about it. Trust me, I'm a chemist. I'm an organic chemist. Hopefully that worked. All right, everybody see test number two review on this. Thank you. This is in lecture folder of D2L. So if you want to see it, go right ahead. 
and look on the screen. You can download it at your leisure if you don't want to take notes now. I guess you could also go back and look at the video tonight, but let's go through it. All right, I should mention, since last time I checked, I don't walk on water unless it's frozen, even then I stay off it. Once in a very rare time, I'll forget to talk about something in the review, but if I talked about it at least twice in lecture or going over it in a problem set, it's fair game on a test. All right, let's get started. ROH, hydroxy group on a carbon, alcohol. How do you name them? Drop the E at the name of the alkane that has the longest chain with the carbon with the hydroxyl group, replace it with an OL. If it's acyclic, not in a ring, you need a number, what carbon that hydroxyl group is on. And that should always be the highest priority, lowest number. Remember, you only number chains from the ends. Now, in a ring, no number, because that's the only functional group, which it will be in my class. It's always number one, everybody knows that, so you don't need a number. Now, a special alcohol, when you have a benzene ring with a hydroxyl group on it, and IUPAC said, we're not gonna get those organic chemists to change their name of that compound and use something else, so we'll use the common name as the IUPAC name, and this is phenol. I know some of you call it phenol, but I'll talk later on in the semester why it's really phenol. I think I already mentioned it, but it's phenol. Now, common names, and you should know them so you can draw the structure, which I'll have some problems. You look for an alcohol, name the R group as an alkyl group, and add the word alcohol at the end. And therefore, in rubbing alcohol, we have 70% isopropyl alcohol, which is three carbon center carbon has the hydroxyl group. Now, how do you make an alcohol? And this is the only reaction I ever put on more than one test, because this test number two has nothing other than this reaction from test one material. That's not now. I'll do that on the final. Oops. Tea break. And how do you make an alcohol? Well, as of this point, there are other ways, but the only one I taught you, double bond acid and water, H plus is acid, catalyst, remember water is HOH, you break the pi bond, one carbon gets H, the other gets the hydroxyl group, it follows Markovnikov's rule, the carbon with the most hydrogen, so the double bond gets the hydrogen, the other carbon gets the hydroxyl group, or as Dr. White learned it from my teacher, the rich get richer, the poor get poorer, and we're talking about not dollars, but hydrogens. Let's look at Reactions, if you have an alcohol, remember, time out for important information. Remember, this is your friend, four bonds to carbon. Check your answer, make sure your carbons don't have three or five or 10 bonds, always four. The other thing is, do you break carbon, carbon, single bonds? No, you don't. That will be your friend on test two three, four, and even the final. Now, Zaces rule, or this dehydration, when you uh, react an alcohol, oh, I, the other thing I wanted to tell you, wow, you can tell I'm not under, the, I'm a little under the weather, I forgot, lost my train of thought, where did it go? But anyways, uh, I lost it again. Hold on. Oh, when you look at a molecule, always look for what's different. What's not a carbon-carbon single bond? What's not carbon-hydrogen? Because that's where all the fun and action is. And that should also be something you should do. You do that for nomenclature. You do that for reactions. All right. Here we have an alcohol, the oxygen gave it away with a hydrogen on a carbon, adjacent carbon, carbon next to it with a hydrogen, 
You react it with sulfuric acid. Triangle means heat. Temperature tells you high heat. Sometimes on a test, I'll forget this number. But if you see a triangle, sulfuric acid, alcohol, dehydration of an alcohol, you lose water. And between the carbon with the hydrogen, carbon with the hydroxyl, you get a double bond. As we did in class and also the problem set, this follows Zaysus rule. Zaysus rule is you get the double bond that has the most, listen carefully, carbon atoms directly bonded to the two carbons of the double bond. And we went through that. Now, a simpler reaction, you take an alcohol reactor with HX, where X is chlorine, bromine, or iodine, you replace the hydroxyl group with X. Remember, the carbon with the hydroxyl group will be the carbon that has the X, the halogen on it. Now, as I showed you in class, but it won't be on a test ever, this can react with double bonds. So if you have an alcohol and a double bond, same molecule, you don't want to get rid of the double bond, you use thionyl chloride, SOCl2. And SOCl2 does the same thing, replace the hydrox group, but in this case, with a chlorine on the carbon that has the hydroxyl group. Now, I won't ask you, but I use the terminology in class, but I will never use it on a test. This is a primary alcohol, 1R group on CH2OH. This O in brackets means you're oxidizing it. Lose this hydrogen, this hydrogen, form a carbon oxygen double bond, which later on you learn this is an ally. If you take a secondary alcohol and do the same thing, oxidize it, lose this hydrogen and this hydrogen, and you form a carbon oxygen double bond, and now you have a ketone. Tertiary alcohols do not react. I will never, ever, ever put on a test, give the organic product or products where the answer is no reaction. That will never, ever be a correct answer in my class. And therefore, you don't have to know that tertiary alcohols do not oxidize because I'll never put that on a test. And that was alcohols. There's more, but this is a one semester class. And I think I want to be able to spend more time on things interesting to you, which is how I designed this class. Now, next functional group I talked about, thiols. Thiols were in, like an alcohol, but instead of an oxygen and a hydrogen, you have a sulfur and a hydrogen. Now, I didn't ask you to learn the nomenclature of thiols. The important thing you should know, one, thiols stink. <laughs> Smell of skunk. Yep, that's a thiol. They stink. The other thing, which is an unfortunate tragedy that happened in the mid-1930s in Texas in a high school and killed many people, is natural gas has no odor. But the natural gas you smell from your stove or oven, if it has a leak or the flame didn't go on, you can smell it because they put a thiol in there. The thiol is T-butyl thiol, stinky, real stinky, because they only put five pounds of this thiol in every, listen carefully, billion, yes, billion pounds of natural gas to make it stink. So you can smell it real quick, only a tiny amount. That's how stinky thiols are. So for thiols, you should know. It's got a sulfur instead of an oxygen, SH on the carbon, and it stinks, and it's put into natural gas so you can smell a leak. Next, I talked about ethers. Ethers, you have an oxygen with two R groups, R and R prime. Now, I didn't go through the IUPAC nomenclature in terms of you have to know it for my test, but common name you should know. When you have an ether, name each R group 
as an alkyl group, and then add a word ether at the end. If this was CH3 and this was CH3, two CH3s die, CH3 methyl, dimethyl ether. Now, how do you make an ether? The Williamson ether synthesis. Take an alkoxide, RO minus, NA plus, an alkyl halide, I don't have it down here, but by now you should know X can be chlorine, bromine or iodine. And this negative charge oxygen attacks and bonds to the carbon with the halogen. You lose the sodium plus, halide minus, you get a salt and you get an ether. The carbon that's on the oxygen here is still the carbon on the oxygen in R. And that's the Williamson ether synthesis. Now, next thing I talked about epoxides, but I only talked about one, ethylene oxide. Three-membered ring, where one of the atoms in the ring is an oxygen. And at first glance, oh, it's an ether, no. It's an epoxide, it has totally different chemistry than ethers. And the first reaction I showed you, you take an alcohol, react it with ethylene oxide. This oxygen goes to that carbon, the hydrogen goes to oxygen, opens it up, and you make this ether alcohol. Again, one molecule or mole of alcohol with one molecule or mole ethylene oxide, you form this ether alcohol. Now, if you take an alcohol and react it not with one, but with n moles or molecules of ethylene oxide, you get this polyether alcohol, where the repeating unit OCH2CH2 is repeated n times. Now, common mistake students make, they put the hydroxyl group inside the bracket, wrong, don't do that. The hydroxyl group is outside the bracket here. And this is a polyether, many ether alcohol. And we'll talk later when we get into surfactants. This is used in a lot of your personal care. So is this, but more of this, things like your skin lotions, hair conditioners use these type of molecules. Next, I got to talk about my favorite area, one of them in organic chemistry, aldehydes and ketones. An aldehyde carbon double bond to oxygen with a hydrogen R group, aldehyde carbon double bond to oxygen with a hydrogen R group, ketone carbon double bonded to oxygen with a R group and a second R group. That's a ketone. By the way, ketone is not spelled with a Y, even though students like to do that. But good news, I don't take off for those kind of spelling error. Hold on one second. No. Everybody see my whiteboard? Everybody see the carbonyl? Thank you. All right, you should know. Carbonyl group, that's a carbon atom or carbon double bond to oxygen. And there are two other things on there because there are four bonds to carbon. You should know how to draw a carbonyl group. You should know how to write down with words, what is a carbonyl group?
carbonyl group, double bonded carbon, double bond to oxygen. This is how you draw it, carbon, double bond to oxygen. And this is how you say in words, what is a carbonyl group? Remember, a carbonyl group is not a functional group. It's found in other functional groups like ketones and aldehydes. And in my personal opinion, it's probably the most important concept of all of organic chemistry. But that's because Dr. White is a carbonyl synthetic organic chemist. And most of the work I've done that, like my patents and things like that, if you look at it, you'll find out a carbonyl group is quite instrumental in allowing me to do new things that nobody else could do. Dr. White loves carbonyl groups. And they love me too. They've been very good to me. All right, how do you name an aldehyde? You find the longest chain with a carbonyl carbon. Carbonyl carbon, carbon double bond to oxygen. Name it as an alkane, one through 10. Methane through decane, you learned that for test number one. And then you drop the E at the end of the alkane name and put in AL. Now, you can't have a aldehyde in a ring, it's impossible. And therefore, everybody knows carbonyl carbon is the best, it rocks. Therefore, it's always number one. And for aldehydes, you don't need a number. And then you remember the rest of the stuff for as you do alkyl groups you've already done. One thing I should caution you, remember alcohols have an OL ending, aldehydes AL. When you're writing something, a name down, if it has an OL or AL ending, make sure you're clear because you don't want me guessing, is that an O or an A? I can be 50% wrong or 50% right, either way, I wouldn't gamble on the test and you shouldn't either. Now, once again, IUPAC in their infinite wisdom, I truly mean that, said, oh, this molecule, when R is a benzene ring in an aldehyde, for many eons, it's been called benzaldehyde. And they said, well, we'll make this also the IUPAC name. So you should know, when R is a benzene ring in an aldehyde, carbonyl hydrogen R group, it's called benzaldehyde. Now let's look how we do ketones. Ketones, carbonyl, carbon double bond to oxygen with R and R prime. First of all, find the longest chain or ring that has the carbonyl carbon, carbon double bond to oxygen. Name it as an alkane or cycloalkane. Drop the E, add O-N-E. Now, if it's a cyclic, not in a ring, it needs a number, which carbon in that chain is the carbonyl carbon. Carbonyl carbons rock, they really are the best, and therefore, it should always have the lowest number. For rings, cyclic compounds, you need no number because carbonyl carbons and ketones are the highest priority. And they are always number one, no matter what. And therefore, you don't need a number because everybody knows that. Now, there are two common names I asked you to learn, which on test number two, if I ask, draw the structure of formaldehyde, Formaldehyde is the simplest aldehyde where R is a hydrogen. And it turns out this undergoes most of the chemistry as aldehydes, and it is an aldehyde. Oops. And next, we have acetone. By the way, nobody ever calls formaldehyde methanol. And we have acetone is the simplest ketone where R and R prime are methyl. No one ever calls that two propanone 
and SAS talk. And once again, very important carbonyl group. Carbon double bond to oxygen, carbon double bond to oxygen. Now, how do you make an aldehyde or ketone? Take a primary alcohol, oxidize it, get an aldehyde. We just did this, I'll go through it quickly. Take a, <coughs> excuse me, secondary alcohol, oxidize it, lose two hydrogens, form a carbon oxygen double bond, you get a ketone. Now, a really, really, really special, neat way of making a special type of ketone, an aromatic ketone, or one of the R, R groups of the benzene ring is to take benzene, react it with an acid chloride, it's an R group and a halide chlorine attached to a carbonyl, use aluminum trihalide, then this R carbonyl, you lose this chlorine, is bonded to the carbon on the benzene ring, and you lose one of the hydrogens. So this is called Friedel Crafts acylation, and you should know how to make an aromatic ketone. We did this in a problem set. All right, now the next four reactions, I'll never put on a synthesis problem. If you take ketone or aldehyde, remember this is when R prime is hydrogen, it's an aldehyde. When R prime is carbons, it's a ketone. If you're reacting with, now you gotta pay attention, one molecule or one mole of an alcohol, H plus acid catalyst, keep your eye on the carbonyl carbon, that's where the fun is, it opens it up, the OR group from the alcohol is bonded to that carbon, and you get an OH on there. One molecule of alcohol, this is what you get, What's attached to the carbonyl carbon? Our prime, our double prime, or hydrogen, our double prime is still attached to that new that carbon. Now, if you take a ketone aldehyde, now react it with two molecules of an alcohol, that's what this two is, acid catalyst, you now form an acetal or ketal. Keep your eye on the carbonyl carbon. What's attached to it is still attached to it. And you get two OR groups now attached to that carbon. I was thinking last night about what I'll be talking about today. And I said, oh, I wonder if I talked about this. And I don't think I did, so I better talk about it now. Uh, I've got my PhD with Dr. Roosh from Michigan State. He was my PhD advisor. I worked in his group and I'll be forever grateful for what he taught me and the foundation he helped build in my mind for organic chemistry. Now his advisor was the great organic chemist Herbert Stork. I forgot what New York University Dr. Stork came from. And one of the things Dr. Stork invented or discovered, I like invented better, he just didn't walk around and say, oh, look what's under the rock. He invented this, created it, this is the following. Better check, I forgot to. Everybody see my whiteboard? Good. All right, now if we look at this reaction, I have any ketone or aldehyde reacting with this. Oh look, carbon with a hydroxyl, a second carbon with a hydroxyl. This is ethylene ox, ethylene glycol, and acid catalyst. And what's really happening in this reaction is the following.
if you have a ketone or alcohol, what ethylene oxide, ethylene ox, ethylene glycol is right up here is really this, two alcohols. They just happen to be in the same molecule. And if we look down here, keep your eye on the carbonyl carbon, which is this one, it was attached to it, our primer hydrogen, our double prime, and then you get the two OR groups from the alcohol. In this case, what's R CH2? So if I look for any ketone or aldehyde, oops, What's attached to what was the carbonyl carbon, our primer H, our double prime is there. I'm going to have two oxygens. What's my R group? CH2. CH2. Do you break carbon carbon single bonds? No. So the bond here is going to still be there. Ooh, that's a real big bond. And This is still there. Now, what is this? This is a way of what we use in organic chemistry. This is for ketones and aldehydes. What if you have a reaction that will react with the functional group you want, but also with ketones and aldehydes? By running this reaction, you put on a protecting group, and that's what this is called. Because I can take this off and get back to my ketone or aldehyde, by just reacting it later on with acid and water, which I'll cover in a little while. And this was a great achievement because it allowed you to do things where you had a functional group plus a ketone or aldehyde. Where is this important? Turns out steroids, they're your hormones. Making those in the lab, you sometimes have to protect it. Now, if it were raining outside, see the door there outside, <laughs> Uh oh, bad humor Monday slipping out. But anyways, what would you do if you're going to your car outside in the parking lot? You would use an umbrella or put on a raincoat. And when you came back into the building, would you still hold the raincoat, I mean the umbrella, or wear the raincoat? No, you'd take it off because it was done protecting. And that's what that reaction is. Let me show you how to do one and then I'm going to give you a chance to do it too. And if we look at the following, and the question is, give the organic product or product for the following the reaction. Ooh, oxygen, double bond to carbon. Hydrogen, it could be our prime. And our double prime, it's an aldehyde, it could be a ketone. Ooh, what's this? Hydroxyl group on a carbon, a second hydroxyl group. That's definitely glycol, but it's really two alcohols and the general reaction, keep your eye on the carbonyl carbon. What's attached to that carbon directly stays attached. Our primer hydrogen, our double prime, you get two oxygens and you get the R groups from the alcohol. Well, in this case, this is R but don't forget, you don't break that carbon to carbon single bond. And what's attached to the carbonyl group, I'll call this our prime, our double prime is still there. Carbonyl, which is no longer H, methyl. My two oxygens, my CH2, CH2, remember, 
that bond. Now, can you guys keep a secret? For some reason that I've never been able to figure out, students like to forget to put this bond right here in. I don't know why they leave it out, but remember, there's always four bonds to carbon, and you don't break carbon, carbon, single bonds. Don't forget that bond. And I'm going to share because I haven't so far. I better. Your turn. Give the organic product or products for the following. And when you're done, give me a thumbs up, please. Oh, well, I remember, because I didn't last week, and this happens even if I was at ECC. I've done this a couple of times where I don't look at the syllabus. Oh, it's going to be this week's lab. And last week, I did the aldehydes and ketones, which is okay, but I really should have done the distillation lab. So this Wednesday, I'll be doing the distillation lab for you people. Anybody need more time? If you're done, give me a thumbs up. I know a couple of you are already done. Give you a little more time. All right, let's do it. What do we have that's different here? Oxygen, double bond to carbon. Got carbons here, carbons here. And this is a ketone. What do we have here? Oh, hydroxyl group on a carbon, alcohol. Oh, wait, there are two of them in there. And that's the same as two alcohols. Acid catalyst. Keep your eye on the carbonyl carbon. What's attached to it? R prime or hydrogen, R double prime. You get two oxygens and the R group from the alcohol is on the oxygen. Well, what's R prime methyl, R double prime ethyl? If you switch them, that's okay. It's the same molecule. I'll keep my eye on the carbonyl carbon right here. What's attached to it? R prime methyl our double prime ethyl. Then I'll have my two oxygens. What's our CH2? But don't forget this bond because it's still there. Now, one of the things I didn't mention, which I won't ask on a test, but why is this so good? And a high yield means you make a lot of it. Because here, when you have two separate alcohols, 
it takes long, uh, it's harder to get the second one to react. Not that harder, but the yield is a little lower. Here, the second alcohol is in the same molecule as the first one. And after you put the first one on there, we have what's called an intramolecular reaction. It's all in the same molecule. And those are always very fast and easy. So overall, this is a very good thing. And this helped make Dr. Stork, Herbert Stork, renowned in the organic chemical world. And if you notice, I have here a special case, which I just talked about when you use ethylene glycol. By the way, ethylene glycol is quite cheap. I won't ask it on a test, but you put this in water and we call that antifreeze. And I mentioned that earlier. Now, once you get the hemiacetal, hemiketal, if you take it, react it with acid and water, you'll get back the ketone or aldehyde plus the alcohol you would have used to make this right here. Now, there are only two places in all of organic chemistry where you have a carbon with two separate oxygens in it. This is one of them. Notice you get an aldehyde or ketone plus an alcohol. Here we have an acetal or ketal, which I'll never ask you. You have a carbon again with two oxygens. Here you have an R group on one, H. Here you have two R groups and acid and water, and it breaks it back down to the aldehyde or ketone you would have used to make the acetal or ketal plus the alcohol. Now, notice I have two very small in quotes. That means you don't have to put it down there because organic chemists, unless you have to, don't balance chemical equations. Now, the interesting thing is on a test, if these were the same, R prime and R double prime and R, you'd get the same answer because we don't balance equations. All right, now let's talk about one of my special heroes in organic chemistry, Victor Grignard, the great French chemist, organic chemist. You take an alkyl halide, carbon with a halogen, halogen, chlorine, bromine, or iodine, react it with magnesium, you get the Grignard reagent. Important is RMGX. The carbon with the halogen is now bonded to the magnesium and the magnesium is bonded to the halogen. If you swap these and put XMG, I'd mark it wrong because nothing like that exists. Now, what's the beauty of the Grignard reagent? you can form a carbon-carbon single bond, something very special, something very rare. I take a ketone or aldehyde, react the first step with a Grignard, second step acid and water, that should be H2O, the oxygen somewhere around. If you find it, let me know. When it, ooh, that was awful. But that should be H2O. And what you get is this alcohol, and what's attached to it, our prime or hydrant, our double prime, still there. This carbonyl opens up to an alcohol, and the R triple prime is bonded to the, what was the carbonyl carbon. And you form that special carbon carbon single bond. The carbon with the MGX is the carbon bonded to this carbon with the hydroxyl group. The carbon with the MGX is the carbon bonded to the carbon with the hydroxyl group in R triple prime. Good news, this one right here, I won't do a synthesis problem. All right, carbonyl group is a double bond carbon oxygen double bond, but it has one pi bond, one sigma bond. And as you learned with alkenes, carbon-carbon double bonds, if you take a react with hydrogen and catalyst or the catalyst nickel, platinum, or palladium, you break the pi bond and each 
atom of the carbon oxygen double bond gets a hydrogen and you make an alcohol. And this is another way or as we say, way of synthesizing. Remember synthesizing is the fancy word for making an alcohol. So if you have a ketone and aldehyde and there are a lot in mother's nature, uh, mother nature has created, you need the alcohol like this, hydrogen and a catalyst. And if I look at the clock, I see we're seconds away from the break. So guess what? Let's take a break now. I'm gonna go stretch my back. It's been very nice to me. Thank you, back. And I'll see you at uh, 155, five minutes from now. Do come back.
kicked everybody back to class. <laughs> it worked. All right, let's continue where we left off. I showed you if you had hydrogen, a catalyst, a double bond of a carbonyl group, you break it open to make a alcohol. Now, hydrogen and catalyst will also react with a carbon-carbon double bond. So if you have a ketone or aldehyde and double bond, and you want to get rid of, make this into an alcohol, but not get rid of the double bond, this won't work. And I showed you a important reaction developed by Dr. Herbert Brown of Purdue, I think, in the, uh, University years many years ago, and he won the Nobel Prize for this. If you react an aldehyde or ketone with lithium aluminum hydride, <clears throat> excuse me, that's LiAlH4, that's an ugly looking four, second step acid and water, it does the same thing as hydrogenation. You break the pi bond and each atom of the double bond gets the alcohol, gets the hydrant, you make an alcohol. Lithium aluminum hydride will not react with carbon carbon double bonds, but will react very nicely, and I've used it, with carbon oxygen double bonds. And notice, just in case you didn't realize it, this would be one you could do a synthesis with. And finally, the alcohol condensation. And here, I'll do a special GIF. I will write this twice. Notice I have the same aldehyde. You can do this with ketones, as you saw in the lab last week, but I will stay away from ketones in this class. And the carbon bonded to the carbonyl carbon is called the alpha carbon. And the alpha carbon has acidic protons that you can take off to form the enolate anion which attacks the carbonyl carbon of the other aldehyde itself, mother molecule, and does something very special. Forms a carbon oxygen double bond, opens this up to an alcohol. What's attached to this carbon is still, what's attached to this carbon is still there, and we call that an aldehyde condensation. I think I covered everything I wanted to. Any questions? Going once, twice. You know something? With my back doing better, but still, I need a pick me up right now. Oh, wait, I do see a question. A bar where you can find the problem sets that's for each chapter. Look for the alcohol, the ether, ethylene, epoxides problem set, and the aldehyde problem set. And that's where you find all the questions that will allow you to practice, okay? Well, like I say, I need a pick me up. So, hold on a second. It's time to play that fun game, circle and name the functional group or groups, two points each. And this is that fun game where you get to find and name the functional group.
and have fun, circle and name the functional group two points each. And I assume everybody can see it on your screen right now. Thank you, Alondra. By the way, I think, how many of you are our cat owners? Give me a thumbs up. Nope. I think the other school, I've got a number of students who are cat owners. How many of you are dog owners? How many of you are listening to my phone ring? Oh, it's a robocall. I'm going to let my answering server uh, machine pick it up. Stop. Thank you. I hope you're having fun playing that fun game. Circle name the functional group or groups in. Oh, I gave you a whole lot to do. Have fun. And for those who finish early, please wait. I try and give everybody time to finish. If you're done, give me a thumbs up. Hang in there, letting one more person any more time, a little more time. All right, before we continue with this, time for a public service announcement from me, Dr. White. Coming up soon is an election, probably the most important election in my life ever. Brave men and women have died so we can vote uh, in Illinois, which most of you, I think, do live in Illinois. You have until a couple of days before the election to register. I'm going to be, I already got my absentee or mail in or drop off ballot because at my age, I don't want to go into an election polling place. I don't know how safe that would be for me. Hopefully it is safe, but I'm not taking any chances. Make sure you vote. If you're over 18, there's no excuse whatsoever for you not voting. Vote. All right, let's go look at that fun game. Circle and name 
the functional groups, two points each. All right, how do you play this game? You look for what's different. What's not carbon, what's not hydrogen, what's not a carbon-carbon single bond? Ooh, look, oxygen. And we have it double bonded to hydrogen and our group, what's this? An aldehyde. Now, you don't have to put this down. And if you circle an extra carbon or two, that's all right. Let's go to B. What's the, ooh, an oxygen. It's got a hydrogen and it's to this carbon. It's got other carbons on it. And this is an alcohol. And you could circle more, but that's good. Let's go up to C. Ooh, an oxygen. It's got carbons here, carbons here. They're different, they could be the same. And what do we have? We have an ether. And that's an ether. Let's go to D. Ooh, an oxygen here. And it's double bonded to carbons here and here. And what is this? It's a ketone. We come to E over here. Oh, I've got an oxygen here. And it's carbons here and here. And what is this? An ether. Wait, I'm not done. I've got a carb oxygen with hydrogen on carbon. And what is this? An alcohol. I'm still not done. Another oxygen, double bond to carbon with the hydrogen carbons. And this is an aldehyde. And let's move on to F. If we look at F. Ooh, I've got a hydroxyl group oxygen on carbon. Alcohol. We come up here. I have another oxygen double bond to carbon. Carbons here and here. And that's the ketone. Oh, I'm not done. Another oxygen here, carbons here and here. This is an ether. Oh, another oxygen. Double bond to carbon, hydrogen here, carbon there. And that right there is an aldehyde. And I think in F, I threw in everything but the kitchen sink. And that's how you play that fun game, circle and name the functional group. If you can't circle and name a functional group in a molecule, how can you name it? Because you don't know what it is. And also, how do you know how it reacts? So it's important always to play that fun game, circle and name the functional groups. By the way, anytime I look at an organic molecule, I immediately, I think it's over here, it's set up. I pick out what's different and I find out what functional groups am I dealing with because that's where all the fun happens. All right, any questions about the material in any way that will be on test number two? Going once, twice, done. Let's move on to 
carboxylic acids, this is what I'm talking about now, will be on test three, but not test two, coming up this Wednesday. Don't forget Wednesday after class, I'll send out the password for the PDF file that will be in the assignment area D2L for you to download. You'll have until I think nine or 10 o'clock the next morning. If you're over 10, 15 minutes, I won't do anything. Don't tell anybody I'm being nice. Let's get back to carboxylic acids. Remember, carboxylic acid is a carbonyl, carbon double bonded oxygen with a hydroxyl group and an R group on it. And this is a carboxylic acid. Remember, this hydrogen is acidic. I showed you reactions, nomenclature, quick review. Find the longest carbon, the longest chain that has a carbonyl carbon of a carboxylic acid. Drop the E at the name, end of the name of the alkane of that chain. Replace with OIC and the word acid. Carbonyl uh, carbon is always number one, so you don't need a number, just like aldehydes. A couple of important common names formic acid. When R is H, and this is the molecule that the fire ants use along with water and heat temperature to attack, to defend themselves, to give people what it seems like a heat burn. It's really an acid burn. When R in a carboxylic acid, is methyl, this is acetic acid, and nobody ever calls this ethanoic acid. And you take about 4% of that, plus about 96% water, and you get vinegar. And finally, benzoic acid is both the IUPAC and the common name and that's when R is a benzene ring. And this is both the IUPAC and common name. So if I ask what's the IUPAC name for this molecule, it's benzoic acid. And the switch is off for this. We talked about the switch was off, switch was off. Talked about the acidity, showed you this reaction. Sodium hydroxide, but I also rewrote it. Dr. White's lazy, one of these days I should change the slide. where M is the one of the alkaline metals, lithium, potassium, or sodium. I guess you could use the other ones, but I've never touched them. I doubt you will either. Now, if you don't want to show charges there, that's okay. I showed you this very special reaction. You take a carboxylic acid, react it with baking powder. You get three products, a carboxylate anion, water, and CO2, and the arrow tells you it's given off as a gas. If you remember, I talked about the little rocket ship. My father showed me how to put baking powder and vinegar in there and make it blast off, which my friends and I did. And also I talked about how in 
making tomato uh, spaghetti sauce, the tomatoes and tomato sauce has citric acid, a carboxylic acid. My father put a small amount of baking powder at the end when he'd make a big pot of spaghetti sauce that gave it a mild taste. And don't forget, add just a little pinch of cinnamon and you'll have the world's best spaghetti. There are other things you need to add like onions, garlic, etc., basil, and a touch of oregano and salt and pepper. But if you do this, cut back a little on the salt because sodium acetate this or sodium citrate, your tongue thinks it's salty. I showed you how to make a carboxylic acid, oxidation of a primary alcohol strongly will get you to a carboxylic acid, oxidation of aldehyde, same thing. And I believe this is where we ended off. I gave an example and I hope you liked my little review. And let's go through this one again. We take a Grignard reagent where X is chlorine, bromine, or iodine, reacted with carbon dioxide, also known as dry ice, second step acid, and I should have had here water, you'll make a carboxylic acid that's one carbon longer than the R group you started with, R plus this carbon. And this is one of those special reactions because the Grignard reagent will let you do that, certain cases, to make a carbon-carbon single bond. Come on. I'll let you try this one out on your own. What would be the product or products for the following? In case you haven't learned this, I'll help you out. Your turn. All right, everybody done? When you're done, give me a thumbs up. All right, I think everybody's done. Remember, look at a molecule, what's different? What's not carbon, what's not hydro? Ooh, magnesium halide on a carbon, Grignard. Carbon dioxide, second step acid and water. And here you have a Grignard, which attacks the carbon of the CO2, it's like a carbon, no carbon. I showed you that last week. And you make a carboxylic acid that's one carbon longer 
What's my R group? This. That should be a C, oh, that's uglier than all hack. That's better. And that's what you, oh, let's do another one. Dr. White loves Grignard reagents. And why don't you try this one for your fun and enjoyment on this Monday afternoon. And Dr. White's feeling a lot better because my back's being nice to me. Everybody say, thank you, Dr. White's back. Just think that will live forever on YouTube. Remember, this will be on test number three material. And normally when I'm in class at ECC, I do this where we finish up. Remember, I gave you an extra week to study and practice. So you'll do good on test two, please. All right, let's do this. If I look here, ooh, a ring. That's carbon, carbon, single bond. Methyl group, methyl. ooh, carbon with magnesium iodide, that's a Grignard, reacting with CO2, second step acid water, and you form a carboxylic acid that's one carbon longer than the R group you started with. What's my R group? This right here. So I'm gonna draw it again, because you don't break carbon, carbon, single bonds, the carbon with the Grignard, this one right here, will be this carb bonded to this carbon of the carbonyl carbon of the carboxylic acid. And that's the molecule we get. Wow, that's a nice fancy one. And that's how you make carboxylic acids. Look out, it's new functional group time. <laughs> and we're gonna talk about new functional groups. And these functional groups are derivatives of carboxylic acids. Derivative means derived from or made from. Now, I should warn you, in this new functional group of this chapter, we're gonna talk about something that smells really good. I mean, really good. I'm also going to share a very personal story about me and my mother and this functional group. Really? Yep. And we'll get to talk about something that you want to hold up to your nose, like flowers. So sounds like exciting times. I better go start moving ahead. Now, we're going to talk about carboxylic acid derivatives. I'll never ask you what is a carboxylic acid derivative, but I'll use the term. That's a compound which the hydroxyl group of a carboxylic acid is replaced with other things or other groups. And the first one is an ester. An ester is where you have a carbonyl group replace the OH with OR prime. And this is called the ester. Now, ooh, at the other school a couple of years ago, I was teaching the same class. I had a student whose name was Esther. And every time I said the word Esther in class talking about this functional group, 
her head would snap up and say, did you call me? It was rather cute. She was glad when I moved out of Esther's because that way her head wasn't always snapping around. Did you call on me? Anyways, carbonyl, O-R prime, R ester. Now, unfortunately, the next functional group, don't write this down, call an acid halide, acyl halide or acid halide, is when you have carbonyl with an R group and replace the OH with a halogen, and X here is chlorine, bromine, or iodine. I've only worked with chlorine. I've used these. Unfortunately, I only have so much time this semester, so I won't be able to talk about that. Oh, it's sad, but I think you'd rather learn about carbohydrates and fats and oils and proteins than acid halides because you're never going to use it. But esters, very important functional group. Esters are derived from carboxylic acids, and that's where you replace the hydroxyl group with OR prime. And that's an ester. I wonder how they came up with names, functional group names. Some Saturday or Sunday when I have nothing better to do, I'm going to check it out on the internet. They have it. All right. Let's look at how you name the IUPAC nomenclature for esters. Now, what you do is, and I'm going to, I'll never ask you to write this down, but I'll go through it in a second. You name the R group, R prime group, which is the group bonded to the oxygen as an alkyl group that goes in front. Then change the name of the carboxylic acid used to make that ester. Think of R prime as H, name it as a carboxylic acid. Find the longest chain with the carbonyl carbon. Drop the E at the end and add IC, drop the IC and acid at the end and add ATE. Now, there's a second way I'm going to teach you that a really ingenious Chem 170 students years ago came up with. I said, except for one case, it works all the time. But before I do that, let's talk about esters in nature first. And here, guess what? Esters are responsible for the flavor and fragrance of many flowers and many fruits and vegetables. If you eat a banana, what you smell and what you taste is this ester, common name pentalastate. If you smell a rose, it has a number of different estimers Ester, yeah, esters that give the rose a special smell. I don't know about you, but I like roses. And over the years, the women I've dated loved roses too. In fact, who is the story I hadn't planned? Many years ago when I lived in Chicago uh, by the beach in Rogers Park, not far from uh, Loyola University, a block or two away, there was a shopping center and they had some small storefronts. And one of them was this glass blower. He made the ships and other things. And one day I was walking by his shop and I saw this beautiful vase and a rose, glass rose that he had made. So I walked in, introduced myself, said, you do beautiful work and I'm an organic chemist. I know glass blowing or had stuff made for me. When I was at Michigan State, we had a three of the best glass blowers you ever would want to make things for you. And I asked, how much is the rose and the vase you made? Oh, those are cheap. So I bought one, gave the girlfriend. A couple of years later, a new girlfriend bought one, another girlfriend bought one. 
And then he moved the shop to Lake Geneva. And I never went up there, but I knew some friends who were going up there and I'd heard he moved the shop there. I said, go in there and see if he's still there. And they went and they said hello to him. And they said, oh, a friend of ours, we used to buy roses from, oh, the guy used to give his girlfriends roses. Yeah, he was a good customer of mine. He did beautiful work. But roses, real ones, what you smell are esters. Now, hate to scare you, but if you like perfume, the majority of the chemicals in perfume are esters. So when you go to buy a perfume, what you're really buying is esters. And now for a very personal story. Uh, Back when I was in high school, I had a very bad talent. I could get my mother mad at me like that. I'd say something and she'd go ballistic and I shouldn't have said it, but I, this, I had a talent. And my father would come home and said, all right, what'd you do to get her upset? And he said, come on, think about something before you say things to her. And sometimes she'd get very upset with me. And if I were in the doghouse, you know, really upset, and she was real mad at me, the only way I'd get out of the doghouse, she not being mad at me anymore, was I'd go, and this, we lived in the Lincolnwood Skokie area, and the biggest shopping center nearby was Old Orchard. It's got another name, but everybody still calls it Old Orchard up in Skokie area, in Skokie, Illinois. And I'd go, then it was Marshall Fields, now it's Macy's. I go to the perfume counter and say, could I have a bottle of Chanel number no. five, my mother's favorite perfume. And it was quite expensive. It's still quite expensive. And the more trouble I got into, the bigger the bottle, and the more I had to lay out. After a year or two, the women at the perfume counter, when they'd see me, they said, oh, what'd you say to your mother to get her mad now? And but that always got me out of the doghouse. And that was using esters. Now, one other interesting place esters are found in is sex pheromones. What's a sex pheromone? That's a chemical an animal, the female, emits when she's in heat. And that attracts males to her so they reproduce. And sex pheromones are esters. So if a cat or dog goes into heat and, and gets attention from all the males in the neighborhood, that's because it's a sex pheromone. Now, and it's an ester. For many years now, people have been looking for the human sex pheromone. And if you think about it, perfume has been sort of an imitation of that. Women put it on, you know, to attract people or make them smell nice, but a lot of times to attract men. And for many years now, scientists are looking for the human sex pheromone. They haven't found it, but a couple of years ago, there was a thing on the radio. Oh, we found it. <laughs> what did they find or claim they found? That male sweat attracts women. Yeah, right. I'm going to go work out for three hours and not take a shower for two days and all the women are going to come flock and think, no, I don't think so. You haven't heard about it. Now, uh, a play on that was every number of years, you'll see a type of TV uh, commercial for uh, cologne for men. Notice they don't call it perfume, but it really is a cologne for men. And the storyline is the same. Put some on and look at all the pretty women who jump you because you've got that sex pheromone on. They don't call it that. And when I was in college or right after, it was name of a bottle that had that kind of line. The product was called Canoe. And it would be, do you canoe? And you put saw the commercial. This guy put some on, stepped outside his house went to the beach and all of a sudden all these pretty women jumped on him. 
And then a while ago, I think about four or five years ago, there was a line of Axe uh, aftershave and cologne. And the same thing, the guy puts them on, jumped, went to the beach or a park, all these beautiful women jumped them. And no, it doesn't work that way. The scientists have yet to find a sex pheromone. All right, let's talk about how do you name a ester. And let's do one. Now, let's take a look at this molecule. Everybody can see it on the screen? Good. How do you know what it is? Look for what's different. Ooh, oxygen here, oxygen here. We have a carbonyl, carbon double bond to oxygen. Oxygen here, on this oxygen is R prime, and the carbonyl, we have R. This is an ester. How do you name an ester? The R prime, you name as an alkyl group and put it in front, methyl. Then, if this were an H, what would we call that carboxylic acid? One, two, three. It would be propanoic acid. Drop the IC in the word acid and add ATE. There's no number here because, like a Aldehyde and carboxylic acid, the carbonyl carbon of an ester is always number one. Now that's one method. The other method, which my student came up with, what works real good, is name R prime as an alkyl group, methyl. Next, find how many carbons are in the longest chain with the carbonyl carbon and name that as an alkane, propane. Drop the E and now here he added O-A-T-E. And this is the IUPAC way, Ooh. naming the carboxylic acid. And this is a student's way. And except for when R is a benzene ring, it works. Let's do another one. I'll do it. I hope you liked the story about the perfume. That was true. It got to the point when I walked in that story of the perfume counter, they had asked me, what'd you do now? But anyways, back to this. I'll do this one. And the question is, what functional group do we have? What's different? Ooh, two oxygens. One is double bond to the carbon. And that same carbon has an oxygen. And on that oxygen, we have carbons. And on the carbonyl carbon, we have carbons. And this is an ester. How do you name it? Let's use the student's way. First of all, R prime, you name as the alkyl group in front, ethyl. Then here, what's the longest chain? One, two, three, four. Oh, I did something I shouldn't do. Everybody change the structure. No, yeah. Change this to CH2. Sorry, Dr. White made a mistake. What's the longest chain? Helps if I had a pen. One, two, three, four, propane.
drop the E. And O A T E, ethyl propanoid. Now, the reason I took this off is, and this won't ever be on a test, because this is my gift to you. For esters, I'll never put an alkyl group on there. Let's do this one. I'll do this one. Methyl group R prime. Now, notice we have on the ester R group an alkyl group. It's branched. And this is on carbon three, so it'd be three methyl. Longest chain five, pentane. I can spell it, drop the E at O-A-T-E. Now this is getting pretty complex. So I'm never for this class, for nomenclature questions, it won't have alkyl groups. That makes your life just a little bit easier. Shh, don't tell anybody I'm being nice. We'll ruin my image around here, okay? If I look at the clock, wow, time flies when you're having fun with organic chemistry with Dr. White. So come back in about five minutes. I need an extra minute to stretch my back besides my legs. And I'll see you at 2.50. Ooh, I'll write it down. 2.50 or 10 to 3. That's when the big hand is on the 10. And, or for those who have digital watches, it says this. With that, I can go stretch. See in a couple.
Welcome back. <laughs> it works. All right, let's continue. And one of the things I should do, not be lazy, bad Dr. White. Let's look at review again for Esther. First thing you do, name R prime as an alkyl group. in front. Then there's two ways of doing the next step. 2A, this is the IUPAC official way. Name the carboxylic acid, pretend R prime is an H, used to make that ester, drop the IC and the word S at the end, and replace it with H-E-E. -E. Then what my very sharp student, Chem 170 student, by the way, Dr. White does not like to take credit for things he didn't do. By the way, I'll decode this in a little while. Name the longest chain with the carbonyl carbon as an alkane and drop the E and add O A. T E. So those are two ways of doing the second step, 2A or 2B, or not, to, whatever. And why don't you try this one? What would be the IUPAC name for the following molecule? Have fun. I think everybody's done. 
let's take a look at this. What's different? Ooh, what's not carbon? What's not hydrogen? Oxygen there, oxygen there, carbonyl, oxygen. I have R prime and R. This is an ester. How do you name it? Name R prime as the alkyl group it is in front, methyl. Find the longest chain. I like to be or not to be. That's the question. Oh, I couldn't resist that one. But anyways, I like this B method for step two. What's the longest chain? One, two, three, four. That contains the carbonyl carbon, butane. Drop the E, add O-H-E-E. And you have methyl butanoate. Oh, this is fun. Let's do another one. Remember, it's still your solid responsibility to make sure I put in the right number of hydrogens. And there you go. While you're doing that, a uh, quick commercial from Dr. White. Don't forget, Monday and uh, Wednesday nights from 6 to 7.15 on Zoom, I have my office hours. If you have any questions about anything, stop by. I'm not that good on figuring out the meaning of life, but when it comes to organic chemistry, I'm pretty good. I think everybody's done. If not, scream at me. Nope, nobody's screaming. That's a good thing. What do we have here? First of all, identify the functional group. What's different? Oxygen here, oxygen here, the same carbon. On this oxygen, I have carbons I'll call R prime. On this carbon, I have carbons. I'll call that R. What do we have? Ester. And now I'll name R prime as the alkyl group it is, my favorite, T or tert-butyl. Then I'll count how many carbons are in the longest chain with the carbonyl carbon. One, two, three, four five, six, seven. That's heptane. Drop the E, add O-A-T-E. I've never said add O, I don't like that. Add, add O-A-T-E, and you have T-butyl heptanoate. Say that five times quickly. No, you don't. Aren't you glad I don't do enunciation quizzes? So am I. All right, let's do one more, because this is an important one, to know how. And I'll do this one. We look at this, whoa, what's going on here? Got a benzene ring there. I've got two oxygens. And what this is, is an ester. What's our prime? Methyl. What's the longest chain? Ooh, there's no longest chain. There's a benzene ring. And here you have to use 
the IUPAC method and pretend CH3 is an H, which would be this carboxylic acid, which is benzoic acid. And what you do is write the name of that, drop the IC in the word acid, and add ATE, and that's now methyl benzoate. Let me do that again. When we can't use the students to be or not to be method, I love to say that. No, I'm not a big Shakespeare fan, but I like that line. When there's no longest chain, it's an aromatic ring, you have to use the IUPAC way. Name R prime as the alkyl group it is in front. Name the carboxylic acid, which would be benzoic acid. Drop the IC in the word acid, add AT, and that's methyl benzoate. Your turn. Oh, excuse me. Don't look. That's the worst ring I've drawn in ages. That's better. And your turn. Give the IUPAC name for the following molecule. Boy, we're getting in some juicy stuff now. And don't forget, you can always impress your friends, neighbors, and loved ones about your knowledge of organic chemistry now, which is growing. Like, you, for those of you who have friends and yourself who love perfume, you can tell them it contains esters. Nah, they don't want to hear that. But you could. I'm going to have to have decals made up and send out to the students. They can put on their thumb. They can go like this. I'm done. Oh, is that a bad idea? All right, let's do it. I think everybody's done. What's different? Oh, benzene ring. Nah. Carbon with oxygens here and here. Carbons here, which I'll call R prime. Carbons here, R ester. How do I name it? Give myself a little more room. Name R prime in front as in the alkyl group it is, isopropyl. Can't do the longest chain. So if this R prime were an H, what would that be? And this you don't have to write down, but I'm doing it for you. That would be benzoic acid. I can spell it. And what do you do? Drop the IC in the word acid. And add ATE. And that would be isopropyl benzoate. Now, there are two types of nomenclature question. One is like you did up here. Here's the structure, give the IUPAC name. And the other is give the 
Here's the name, draw the structure. Now, before I do that, there's one common name of Esther. that you should know. And that's this one. And if we notice this is an Esther. Now, the IUPAC name for this, which nobody ever uses, is ethyl ethanoate. I had to think about it because I never use this name. The common name, which everybody uses, and you should know, named R prime as the alkyl group it is, ethyl. Now, here's where the common name. If this were an H, we have this, carboxylic acid. But this has a common name, and that's acetic acid. So the common name for this ester is derived by dropping the IC and the word acid, just like IUPAC tells us, and adding ACATE. And everybody uses that. And that's called ethyl acetate. And ethyl acetate is this ester right here. I'll draw it again down here. And we have ethyl acetate, which is the common name. Remember, for common names, I'll never ask you, here's the structure what's its common name, but I will give you the common name and ask you to draw the structure. Now, I haven't done it for a little while, but I better do it now. I could have done it when we we're talking about esters in general. Why are we learning it? Because it's part of the odor and taste of flowers and vegetables and fruits. But let's look at ethyl acetate. And you should ask the question, why am I learning this stuff? And the answer is, well, for you, you want to get into a school or program that makes you take organic chemistry. But why? And let's talk about ethyl acetate. A lot of you have it in your house. Do I have ethyl acetate in my house? I don't know. Yes, you do. And what is it? There are two molecules that are used for nail polish remover. One is acetone, which you learned about, and now the other is ethyl acetate. Oh, I used it. I already got my nail polish off. But anyways, uh, for many years, if you went to Walmart or Target, they have a big wall of nail polish remover bottles you can buy. Most of them were acetone, and only a few were ethyl acetate. You can look at the label, and they'll tell you what's on there. Now, if you go, most of them are ethyl acetate, and a few are acetone. Why? Because, no, I take it back, it's the other way around. It used to be all ethyl acetate, now a few are ethyl acetate, more are acetone. Why? Well, ethyl acetate, if you have any cuticles or exposed uh, skin, bare skin or cuts on your finger, you put that on, it doesn't burn like acetone might. But how many of you are familiar with the put the nail polish on and put your fingers under a light nail polish. And that's called photochemistry. And your nail polish, which is <clears throat> quite sophisticated organic chemistry, is being cured as a polymer, I'll teach you about this later on, to harden to make that new super hard nail polish, which I learned about from my Chem 170 students. And hold on, water break. Turns out that super tough nail polish, ethyl acetate doesn't do a good job pulling it off, but acetone does. So 
If you look in your house, you may have acetone, or you probably might have ethyl acetate. So now that we have that, let's look at the other nomenclature type of problem. Here's the name, draw the structure. And if we look at this, how do we know what to draw? You start from this end, the right, move left. OAT ending tells you ester. If I can spell it right. Uh-oh, it's awful spelling Monday. Did I tell you I was always the first one down in a spelling bee? But anyways, if this were an E, octane, eight carbons. including the carbonyl carbon, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Now, in the front of the ester with no number, you have oxygen and my R prime, and that's methyl. And there are four bonds to carbon. And that's how you do it. Let me show you one more. And we have ethyl benzoate. Again, start from the right, OAT ending tells you ester. And, oh, benzo. That tells me I have a benzoic acid derivative. R is benzene ring, carbonyl. And this in front is my R prime, ethyl. And now we have ethyl, this would be from benzoic acid, benzoate. So the OAT ending tells you ester. I better share some fun. And why don't you draw the structure for methylpropanoate? I was just thinking when I did my stretching, I was looking out the window in my living room where I was doing my stretching or by the steps there. And it looks like it's gonna rain soon, which we could use the water. We're colder out, it so it looks like it's gonna snow, but we're not in Minnesota. Yay, they're getting the snow now. All right, let's do this. How do you decode this and find out what to draw? You start from the right and move left. OAT ending, ester. If this were an E instead of OAT, E, that'd be propane, three carbons. Ester, carbonyl, oxygen, what's my R prime? What's in front? Methyl group. And now, I know there are four bonds to carbon. And that's how you do, oh, let's do another one. And 
And why don't you try n propyl known in OA? Who say that five times quickly? Nah. All right, let's take a look at this. How do we know how to decode this? Start at the right, move left, OAT ending, ester. And if this were an E instead of OATE, no name, nine carbons, I better get the word. And that includes the carbonyl carbon. And my R prime is N propyl. Three carbons, the N carbon. And now I get to put in the hydrogens. And that would be N propyl. No, 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 wait. Let's do one more. I want to draw the structure for ethyl benzoate. Well, I fix up that ugly E. All right, while you're doing that, I'm going to have to fix some. There we go. I forgot to ask, well, I'll ask when you're done with this. Oh, by the way, if you listen to our president, you shouldn't listen to scientists. Unbelievable. Anyways, let's talk about fun things. All right, looks like everybody's done. And how do you decode this? Start from the right, move left. OAT ending, ester. But how do I draw benzene? Well, that's from benzoic acid, which has this structure. And therefore, I have a benzoate ester, which is this. Remember, OAT ending, Ester, and when you see benzoate, R is the benzene ring, carbonyl oxygen, what's my R prime, ethyl. And there you go. And that's how you do nomenclature of esters. Now, one functional group that you've already looked at, because we made it, 
that I haven't talked about nomenclature is the following, and now I can do this. This is a carboxylate anion. Also sometimes called carboxylate salt. I like anion myself. Where for this class, M equals lithium, sodium, or potassium. It can be other things, but I'm going to keep it for this class that. Now, how do you name this? What are the IUPAC rules? One, name M plus as the element it comes from, and that goes in front. And then for step two, use either ester 2A or 2B, or not to be, that's the question. Oh, I can't resist that. For the rest of the molecule. And that's how you do carboxylate anions. Let's take a look. Oh, hold on while you write this down, if you're writing it down. All right, let's take a look at an S uh, carboxylate anion. Now, how do we know it's carboxylate anion? Look for what's different. Carbonyl, ooh, oxygen with a minus charge, cation, carbons. And that's the carboxylate anion. So how do I do that? I name my M plus as the element it comes from. What's N plus Na? Sodium. This you name just like an ester, three carbons, propane, drop the E at OATE, and you have sodium propanoate. I'll go through it again. What's different? Carbonyl with an oxygen with a negative charge, and I have a cation. Cation is a species with a positive charge. Ooh, here's a fancy word I haven't used all semester, a moiety. My advisor, Dr. Roosh, loved to use that word moiety <clears throat> and so name the m plus as the element it comes from sodium in front name the longest chain with the carbonyl carbon as an alkane drop the e and add oate now i could put alkyl groups on here and this is carbon is number one, but I won't. That's your turn. Give the IUPAC name for that molecule.
All right, I think everybody's done. Let's take a look at what's there. Ooh, carbonyl, carbon, say carbon, oxygen, but it has a charge on it, negative charge, and I have a cation, M plus. This is a carboxylate anion. And what will I do? I'll name M plus as the element it comes from, lithium. And in this case, what's the longest chain? One, two, three, four, five, pentane. Drop the E, add O-A-T-E, <clears throat> excuse me, lithium pentaweight. Oh, let's do one more. And why don't you try this? What would be the IUPAC name for that? Remember, this one, you got to use 2A. You can't use 2B or not to be. That's the question. All right, I think everybody's done. Everybody done? Yep. All right, what's different? Ooh, a benzene ring, but I got a carbonyl, which also has an oxygen minus. So I'll just call it a benzene ring R. Ooh, I've got a cation, and this is a carboxylate anion. And how do you name it? We'll name the element that makes this cation first, potassium. And then what's the longest? Oh, I don't have the longest chain. What carboxylic acid would be used if this were an H and you had this? How do you name that for a, like an ester, which you also do for carboxylate anions? Drop the IC and the word acid and add ATE. And you have potassium benzoate. And that's how you do that. Everybody with me on that? Okay. Now, there are two types of nomenclature question. One is, here's the structure, give the IUPAC name. And now the other one is, here's the name, draw the structure. And the question is, draw the structure, three points each, for lithium hexanoate. How do you do that? You start from the right and move left. O-I-T-E, O-A-T-E, where did I get the I? O-A-T tells you it could be an ester 
or it could be a carboxylate anion. And how do you tell the difference? That should be a minus chart. You look in front. If you see the name of an element, it's going to be a carboxylate anion. If you see the name in front of an alkyl group, it will be an ester. So if this were E hexane, six carbons. And the N carbon is a carbonyl carbon. I have oxygen minus. Then what's my M plus? Lithium cation. And that's how you do it. Again, start from here, OAT ending now. It could be two different functional groups, ester or carboxylate anion. If you see an element named in the front, it's a carboxylate anion. Your turn. Draw the structure for potassium butanoate. Aren't you glad you got an instructor who knows how to pronounce these stuff? That was awful. I can tell I'm really feeling better. I'm still all charged up, fired to go. All right, I think everybody's done. How do we determine what's the structure? You start, how do you decode the name? You start from the right and move left. Now if we look here, OAT ending, oh, that could be either an ester or a carboxylate anion. Yeah, because you see the element name in front, it's a carboxylate anion. The R group, including the carbonyl, is for E butane, four carbons, oxygen minus, potassium. Hopefully, you know your alkali metals, not all of them, but sodium, potassium, and Lithium, and that's how you do. Oh, let's do one more. And that is lithium benzoate. All right, everybody done? Okay, let's do it. Start from the right, move left. OAT ending. 
S sir. Could be or carboxylate anion. And with uh, L elements name in front, we know it's a carboxylate anion. If this were any way, it doesn't work out. Benzoate comes from benzoic acid. And that means R, either here or here, is a benzene ring. Then I have my carbonyl, my oxygen, and in this case, lithium, Li, and it's a cation. Now, if you don't want to put your charge there, that's okay. Dr. White always will, because it's good habits I don't break. And that's how you do carboxylate anions. Now, one of the things, whoa, what happened there? Huh, that's weird. One of the things that, there, I got it off. I've got so many things hooked up running on this computer that once in a while it goes, I'm confused and I got to help it out. But anyways, why you learn this stuff? Let's go somewhere real quick. If you go to your local home improvement store, you can buy what's called lithium grease. And lithium grease is really good. This got invented about, oh, 10, 15 years ago, not that long ago. Let's see if where's the one, I can't see the one I use. I've used this stuff right here. And what lithium grease is, is a carboxylate anion where R is long, lots of carbons, usually about, oh, 16 to 20 carbons, including this carbon right here. And that makes it very slippery and it's good lubricant. I use it on the rollers for my garage door and a few other places and it works good. Oh, now I look at the clock and we're just about done. Don't forget, oh, hold on one second. There I got, I don't know why it's doing that, but don't forget tonight, my office hours if you need it. And don't forget on Wednesday, I'll be doing test number two after class, sending out the pa password. You have all night and next morning to work on it. And with that, I'll say, gain gesund, be healthy. I'll see you on Wednesday. Bye. Oh, wait a second. <laughs> Bye. Have a good one.